using visual aids. Doesn't that sound like fun? Chapter 14 in Dr. Stephen Lucas's The Art of Public Speaking, 13th edition. I am Dr. Huddy. Welcome back to my basement studio. 14 is not my lucky number like 13, but my birthday is on the 14th of July. Maybe that makes me like this one. I don't know. Using visual aids. As you've noticed, I've used a visual aid throughout all of my presentations. Visual aids can definitely enhance a message, but they can also distract from the message. So let's explore a little bit of why that is. The advantages of using a visual aid, also known as a presentational aid, because visual aids are clearly just visible. Presentational aids include things like audio, messages, video clips, those sorts of things. Visual aids can provide clarity. They can maintain interest. They can help people to retain the information. They can give the speaker more credibility and they can help you to be a bit more persuasive. So there are different kinds of visual aids. Visual aids include objects and models, photos and drawings, graphs, charts, videos, the speaker, and presentation technology. I'm going to take a little bit of a time out here and tell you that this is not what I would consider a good visual aid. Based on my experience when I was younger as a public speaker and based on when I first started teaching public speaking at North Dakota State University, I would say that this presentational aid is missing something. It is missing the visual component. It is missing a picture. Why a picture? Well, the reason for having a picture here is so that it can enhance the verbal message for the listener. It will help them to remember the information longer if they have a vi an image to associate with the message that you have given. You're already talking a lot. You're already giving them a lot of words. This is just more words. I would, however, find this to be just about the right amount of words. 20 words is maximum. You don't want to put the whole presentation on the visual aid. Otherwise, what's the point in you showing up? This is supposed to aid in the presentation, not be the presentation. There are two, two steps to see. Additionally, there. if I was going to do presentational aids, I would have a picture on every slide and I would also have a blank slide in between each content slide. Why is that? So that I can cover up the information so that you all aren't paying attention to it when I'm talking about something else. There is a function on PowerPoint where I could make the slide blank. Now you're focusing on me and not the PowerPoint and then I can change it back. Sometimes though, it's hard to remember to do this. So if all I have to do is click to a blank slide, it'll make it easier for me to keep your focus and attention on me, the speaker, and not on the presentational aid. But while we're back to the presentational aid, let's look at photos and drawings. Photos and drawings should be large enough for your audience to see. You do not want to pass them during the presentation because it will distract from your presentation. So what if, if it is something you have to pass around to the audience, Make sure that you pass them at the end of the presentation, not in the middle. And you also want to display it with presentation technology whenever possible. So we're talking about things like Microsoft PowerPoint, Google Slides, Prezi, Keynote from Apple, or yeah, from Apple. Any of those things are presentational aids using techno presentation technology. You do want to be careful though, because you don't want to put every single word on your presentational aid. This is an example of a drawing that would be helpful. It actually says, this is what a person with dyslexia might see when reading this sentence. I can read it because I've seen this example a couple of different times, but it definitely would be a good example to show what it's like for people who have 
dyslexia. Also, graphs can be useful, especially when we're using statistics, like we talked about in an earlier video. Statistical trends and patterns are easier to comprehend and understand because they are numbers, so they're easier to use if you have a graph or a chart to show you the numbers that are being presented. There is a line graph which uses one or more lines to show changes over time. Here's an example of a line graph. Then there's the pie graph. This highlights segments of circles to show distribution of patterns. In other words, it's like a pie. And some people get the big piece and some people get the little piece. I like pie. I'm hungry for pie. Maybe I should make a pie. That's an example of external and internal noises. Am I right? Bar graph uses vertical or horizontal bars to show comparisons. Here's a bar graph example. Charts are also helpful. They help to summarize a large block of information, usually something such as lists. This helps the listeners to visualize the information, it shows the steps of the process, and it keep, can keep things simple or clear. In the assignments that I give my students about showing the steps of a process or a procedure, I actually make them show the steps of a process or a procedure. They don't just get to do a chart. But if you just got to do a chart, here is an example of a chart. Videos are also important. As you've noticed, I've skipped over some of the videos here because it is sort of difficult for you to watch a video during a video. So I've skipped over the ones that come with Dr. Lucas's textbook. You are certainly welcome to go look them up in the PowerPoint if you'd like to. They are good examples, obviously, because they are included with the textbook. But when you are using a video, keep in mind that it needs to be short. It can't take up most of your presentation. You want to cue the video to the start of the clip. Remember on YouTube, sometimes you're going to have to listen to an advertisement first if you don't cue your video to the right place. You want to be able to integrate it smoothly. In fact, you might want to practice ahead of time so that you know how the technology will work and how it will be integrated into your presentation. And then avoid low resolutions. It's hard enough to deal with a video, keeping it short, queuing it at the right place, and integrating it smoothly. You don't want to have a crappy video that no one can see. If the speaker is going to use himself or herself to demonstrate something, you want to use your body to demonstrate maybe a process or a procedure. You will practice to coordinate your words and your actions. So using yourself as a presentational aid might include things like teaching people how to salsa dance, teaching people karate, teaching people ballroom dancing, teaching people self-defense. Any of these things would be using yourself, your body, the speaker, as a presentational aid. Presentation technology. I gave you a little bit of a crash course about presentation technology earlier, but it combines several audio and visual materials. You want to use it strategically. You want to use it to enhance specific points. You don't want it to overpower your presentation and you don't want to read from the screen. If you notice here, I do sometimes read what's on the screen, but I also turn and look at you, the audience, rather than just spending the entire time talking to, well, technically talking to the wall in my basement. You would be bored, I would be bored, and you would wonder if I even realize that you are there. I'm sure some of you have teachers who do this. Ooh, this takes practice. It's much easier to stare at the wall and the presentational aid rather than get stage fright from actually looking at an audience. Although to me, 
it definitely feels awkward. When you're preparing your visual aids, you want to prepare them well in advance, keep them simple, make them large enough for people to see, limit the amount of text that you include, use fonts effectively. In fact, the same font throughout is probably your best choice. Use color effectively. As you can see here, when I want you to be able to see the materials, it is in black and white, although black and white can get kind of boring. So over here, we also have blue highlighted in yellow and white. Now the font might not be big enough for you to see, but you get the idea of the colors that can be used together. Red will make people angry. So if you plan on using red, please use it strategically. Black is good for a background, but only if you are using bright enough color for the words in the foreground. And use images strategically. Yes, I think you should have an image on every slide, but it should really go along with the content of that slide. It shouldn't just be some random picture. Here's an example of limited text. Actually, this is really cool because this is in my friend's hometown. Mingju Liu lives here in Harbin, China, and they have the Harbin Ice Festival. I thought the Minnesota Ice Festival was awesome until I saw pictures of this. I can't wait to go visit Mingju and see this. So it's held in Harbin, China every year. It is the world's largest ice festival and there are over 800,000 visitors every year. It is so pretty. I bet you didn't even know that there were parts of China that were cold enough to host an ice festival. Effective fonts. As you can see here, they're clear, easy to read. They use normal cases, not some random font. You want to use no more than two fonts per slide. Standardize across slides, so use the same font throughout the entire presentation. And make sure you have properly sized titles and body text, like there are here. Don't do it like it is over there, so you can't read it very well. Here's some effective font examples and some ineffective font examples. Effective colors are high contrast, easy to see, they're limited in number, maintaining the same background throughout the entire presentation and the same color back or same color font throughout the back. <laughs> Ooh, sorry. <sighs> You shouldn't apologize during a presentation unless absolutely necessary, and you shouldn't draw attention to your mistakes. Oops. All right, back to effective use of colors. You want to limit the number of colors that you use for the background and font, and you want to make sure it's consistent across all of the slides and you're in your presentation. If you're using images strategically, you want them to be large enough, you want them to be high resolution, you want them to be clear and simple. For my students, I also count the number of words per slide, including the ones on the images. So if you have an image with a whole bunch of words, I'm going to count that to the towards the total, which means if you have more than 20 words, people are just going to spend their time reading it and not paying attention to you. Also make sure that you include a title on the slides. When you're presenting with visual aids, you want to display them where your listeners can see, avoid passing them around, display only while you're discussing them. Remember, that's what I was talking about with those blank slides. Explain them clearly and concisely. Talk to your audience, not your visual aid. Practice with your visual aids. And check the room and equipment before you begin. It would be very difficult to incorporate a PowerPoint presentational aid if you didn't have a projector and a computer to use while you're presenting. Always have a backup plan. If someone says they have a projector and a computer, you might, you might want to make sure to bring your own copy of the presentation just in case. Bring it on your own computer or bring a hard physical copy that you've printed out just in case the technology does not work. Well. 
presentational aids are an exceptional way to add to and enhance your presentation. However, if they're used incorrectly, they can be a big distraction. 